interesting. You learn. So we continue from with our series. This is the third year on the, the series on from cargo data set to building models in Wicca. We're trying to see that as we say, everybody should be able to demonstrate, should be able to practice what we've been discussing. It's not just theoretical. You should be able to lay your hand on any data set of interest to you, upload it to the platform, Wicca, because it's very easy. You don't need any coding to do that. Thereby promoting what we call codeless AI, that uh, machine learning is for all. So it's not just for people who can write code. So the fact that you don't know how to write code doesn't mean you cannot deploy machine learning application. So we, we had like two, in the past two ways, we've had two data sets demonstrated. So last week it was for the absenteeism, how you can predict how many hours an abs uh, a, a staff is likely to be absent from work, or you have somebody, you have someone that is very, very important that is available tomorrow because some of your important customer will be visiting. You don't want important personnel not to be around to welcome them. So you have a system that can predict ahead of, ahead of time if someone is going to be absent so that you can take mitigating factor or steps to prevent such absenteeism. So today, so today we are going to proceed by looking into customer shun. So, and we say, what is customer shun? That is when a customer decides to leave your industry, your company, for whatever reason. So, so what the system, what people have done is to try to gather as many data as possible in the past. At the beginning, customer shun actually you can use unsupervised learning to do that. That is, since you don't know the customer that we run away, we try to study them, and then try to see, okay, who could be categorized into he might likely run or run away, or he might not run away. However, as it went unfold, we have several free data sets out there that has been labeled. Because when you have labeled data set, then you don't go for unsupervised learning, since that one is a little bit more challenging to get better accuracy. So, so we're going to check out there are several data sets out there on customer shunning. So customer shun is so important to industry, like I said, especially banking and the uh, telecommunication companies, because when you lose a customer, so for, for the bank, the, the, main, the main thing that we call bank is the customer. Once the, your customers are gone, then it's as good as just closing down the bank. So the same thing also goes to the telecom industry. So losing your customer, Potent a very grave danger to the sustainability of that industry. So they're very much concerned. They want to know ahead of, ahead of time who is likely going to leave. So they keep monitoring some of the attributes of customers. So to be able to say, oh, this person might leave. And in order to prevent you from leaving, they give you a lot of incentives. For example, the telecom industry, they keep sending you promotional sales that are not being sent to people who are maybe they, if they don't they notice that you have not been purchasing air credit for the, for some time, suddenly you start getting a lot of very cheap promotions, load just ten, just ten DJ, one digit uh, amount like maybe ten naira or ten real or ten dollars, and you get a lot of air time to speak for free, because they suspected that you are no more buying credit, meaning that you are likely trying to change to another telecom industry. So they want to prevent that. So with customer shun, the, the, the company can know ahead of time who is likely going to run away. Then you can approach him. Sometimes they call you verbally, one-on-one. -on -one, they try to talk to you. Why have you not been buying credit? Do you need help? What can we do? Are you not happy with our service? In order, because they run their system and the system identify you as a potential customer that is likely going to shun the industry very soon. So they try to reach out to you so that they can be able to prevent you from going away by giving you a lot of uh, mouth watering or very, very interesting uh, promotional sales that you can be able to reconsider your position. Now, to do this, customer shun, let's look at uh, some of the data set we, we have. So as usual, you just go ahead. This is a, yeah, this is Kagu. 
just type anything related to customer. Customer. Sean. Okay, you can see. So it's going to bring you a lot of data sets related to customer shown from different industry. See? So let's look at telecom industry for as an example. So telecom, telecom customer shown data set. This is bank, banking customers. That's different industrial banks. The good thing is you look at the attribute. This is what we, we just want to see. The procedure that you take is what really matters. So let's see. Okay. If you look at this, yeah, I think this is an example of a customer shown from the telecom, as the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a body data set. You can see this is telecommunication industry data set. So some possible insight could be what variables are contributed to customer shown. Some of the maybe human objective of this kind of study is we want to know what are the attributes that are actually contributing to a customer leaving the telecom industry. Now someone would just decide to say, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to change to another company for my own telecommunication services. Who are the customers more likely to shun? That is, you want to identify customers that are most likely going to run away so that you do preventive measure. This is again, preventive measure that is uh, preemptively, you, you, can, you preempt that decision to run away. You don't want your customer to leave. So because a lost customer, it's not just that you lose that customer, but it's a potential enemy that will continue to say bad things about your industry. So more customers will definitely not come and you might even lose more. Because it's friends, it's family members, they are potential people to leave also. So because of this, you want to pay attention to even no matter how small that customer looks like, you don't want anybody to leave because of the multiplicative effect it could generate. In your, in your company. What action can be taken to stop them from leaving? You see, these are some of these stuffs that you want to look into. So the data sets is there as usual. Just go here, click it. You can download the data directly. These are some of the attributes. See, that are account week, the contract, the data plan, the person is using, data usage, how much of data usage, how many calls does it make? Okay, let's download the data set as usual. Once you download the data set, you get your data set. Yeah, downloaded. So if it is zip, sometimes you get it zip or directly. Yeah, that is, I think that is telecom shown. So click, 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 click the data. Now it has opened the data set. As you can see, so. This is the shown. This is the class. Zero means no, the customer is going to remain. One means shown. The customer is going to leave or might leave. So these are attributes of customer that left that particular data set the, 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 in the past. The, the customer with this attribute left. So those ones with zero, they didn't leave. So we want to see, okay, with this particular data from history, can we actually develop a model that can successfully predict if a customer is going to leave or is not going to leave? Now, so you can see, so it has successible data, almost uh, 3,333 samples, which is interesting. But something we are going to note is uh, maybe minority left. Of course, this is normal. You don't expect majority to leave. That's going to be a disaster to the industry or to that particular company. So, but something you can notice based on our advice, you just, you need to take your data now to the, to Wicca. However, there are things you need to do, especially Wicca wants you to, since it is classification problem, you need to quickly convert this, this to zero mean no. No, Sean. One means yes, Sean. You need to convert one to yes and then zero to no. And N O. Another thing is uh, this is compulsory. You have to do this. So quickly do this. Just click this. You can save 
use find and replace as the case may be. So anywhere you see one, type yes, replace all. So it has replaced 483, 483 replacement. So what this will tell you is this data is highly imbalanced. It means we only have 483 customer that left. That company that is being used in this data set. It means majority stay. So that is imbalanced data set. So we're going to see how it's going to affect our modeling. Okay, so then don't forget also, you can see one has been converted. Search for zero and then try to make it to be N O, replace all. So this is data pre processing. It has replaced 2,850. It made successfully 285, 2,850 replacement. So now, so once you are done with that, your data is ready to go to the weaker environment. However, one more thing that I often recommend, this is not compulsory. What we have done is compulsory because WICA will not allow you to do classification if you don't do that here. So especially, yeah. So, but for the for the other, the next step is it's always good for your output. This is the target class, what we want to predict. It's good to let it be at the rightmost side of the CSV file. Otherwise, we can we automatically select this as the output, which is not your output. But you can manually tell Wika when you, once you upload your data, there's a place you can tell Wika that no, this is my output. But sometimes people do forget. I've seen people in the experiment, they forgot to move their output to the appropriate place, and they also forgot to do that inside Wika. So the, all the predictions we are done using wrong outputs. We a lot of time doing hyperparameter optimization. At the end of the day, we later realize later, later that no. Why is your result like this? We notice that you are you're actually predicting a wrong parameter. So in order to avoid such mistakes, so usually just move this to the other side. It doesn't cost you much. So just move this in. Let, let the output be at the last. Then you can get out, get rid of this. Colon. Yeah. So save your data set and then you are ready to go. See? So at this point in time, we just get our data. Data is ready now. You can see here contract renewal. These are some of the attributes. Data plan, we kind of data plan, data usage, customer service call. How many customer service call did you make in the past one month or they are about? So number of day minutes, number of day calls. Monthly charges, average fee, roaming minutes, and then you have the attribute you want to predict. So, as usual, you go to a weaker environment, you start the explorer. So, you start the explorer. So, yeah. So, that the explorer. So, you need to open the file. Open the file. We can, yeah. Okay, we have customer shown there. So we tried to open the file, but we couldn't see the file because it's looking for ARFF. So remember to change it here. I'm looking for CSV file because we are using CSV. Now you're going to see that this telecom. This is one that we have converted. This one we converted to yes or no. So we can open the data set. Now, you are in a weaker environment. You are ready to go. So you can see these are the attributes. Clicking it, you can see some of the, what are the attributes of it, the minimum, the maximum, the main. So basic statistical analysis of the data set is presented for you. So this is what we want. You can see here. The yes that is shown customer, they are 483 out of 2,850. So definitely it's seriously imbalanced. Yeah, but still, let's see what we can do with it. So how can we still manage it? How far can we go? Since the data is ready, so the next thing is to move to classify. So select your classifier. You see, 
the classifier matter. The capability of classifier, let's look at zero R with the pen. Even though the data is in balance, you still see classifier that's able to perform acceptably well on them, on the data set. So the fact that your data is in balance doesn't mean, no, you have to lose hope. No, I've seen people say, oh, the data is in balance. What do I do now? I said, first of all, run your experiment. Let's see what you are going to get. Before you start panicking, okay, what am I going to do? Let the data speak. I've worked with data set that is really very imbalanced, but yet we got excellent results. You see? So excellent results in the sense that both classes were fairly classified correctly and wrongly. Because the problem with imbalanced data set is this, the, the, the class that is majority is likely to be more correctly classified. In fact, the entire second class that is lower in, num in terms of number of uh, classes, number, sorry, number of samples, might be classified totally into the opposite side. This is one of the effects of imbalanced data set. But some algorithms have that capability that even with imbalanced data set, they can still perform reasonably well. Now let's try this zero R to see. It's usually the default classifier there. We're using 10 full cross validation. If you want to use 17, 70, 60, it's up to you. So you look at people work on this data in the past. What did they use? You have to compare your work with their work. So whatever data partitioning method they use, you have to use it. So let's use cross validation then. So let's go. Now you can see this default classifier. You see, it has 85% classification, but you don't celebrate. You have to look at the reality because your data is in balance. Now look, go to the um, go to confusion matrix. This is the confusion matrix here. You can see that in the confusion matrix, it correctly classified all the A class. That is no class. That is, those people who didn't shun the company. They were all correctly classified because these are the majority. This is one of the problems of imbalanced data set. The majority class in terms of sample tends to be more correctly classified. So, and not only that, now the second class, the correct one for the second class, which those people who shun the company, they are supposed to be predicted here. None is zero. It's made out of 483 people who shun the company. The model is not able to predict even one of them that are good to shun. Rather, it push all of them to the majority class, saying none of them shun the company. That's why you have zero here, you have zero here. This is the, the class that is going to show, oh, you shun the company, or as the case may be. So this is a problem of imbalanced data set. But then, like I said, does it mean this is how all Algorithm are good to see it. No. Let's check other algorithms and see. Maybe we we'll get algorithm that is able to, despite the imbalance, is still able to get some little reasonable result. Now, let's go for our friend, Lizzie IBK, K nearest neighbor. So we selected K nearest neighbor. The same thing called crow validation. Let's go. Now, you can see that. It's gotten 87% accuracy. We have not done any hyperparameter optimization, just default value, 87% accuracy. This one got 85. However, let's see in detail. Go to, go to the confusion matrix. This is why you see the big difference. You can see here that there are mistakes in both sides. So, 2,655 were correctly classified as not shunning the company. 257 were correctly classified as shunning the company. See, this is, accept this is the acceptable prediction compared to the previous one. At least it doesn't push all the classes to one side. Because what it means in this case of 0R is it's not able to differentiate between the two classes. It push all of them to one side. You see, we don't want this kind of thing. It means it's not able to undo that imbalance. Not at all. But for IBK, it's able to at least try. You can even see that the mistake on the side of this one is, of course, it's less than this. This is the mistake, 
left diagonal is the mistaking classification. You can see the mistakes here. It's almost getting closer. This is 195 from this side, and this is 226 from this side. But then the accuracy is 87. And then you're going to see other precision and other recall who actually indicated. So we can also try other classifier. For example, like uh, let, let's try decision tree. Let's try decision tree like J48 and see what it's going to get. Decision tree is able to get, you see, 92. Despite the imbalanced data set. You see, this is why algorithm matters. And then it's not a dogma that, okay, this algorithm is always better. We discussed this case before. You, see, you have to check out algorithm the that work on your data set. Despite the imbalance, therefore, the decision tree is able to achieve 92% accuracy. We have not done hyperparameter optimization. You see? Power with hyperparameter optimization, we might take it even further. But as you can see in the confusion matrix, what you should watch out for is this side, we know it is the majority class from the beginning. So it's still the majority correctly predicted, which is okay. This is the minority class, 304 out of four something. That's still okay, manageable. The mistake here is 62. People that are supposed to be A, but they are predicted as B. They are just 62. But for this one, they are supposed to be B, but predicted as 179, they are more than this one, which is understandable because this is a minority class. Because the minority class means that the system is not able to see enough samples from this minority class to be able to have a fair representation of their characteristics and attributes so that by this, it got their percentage or it got the correct classification affected. Now, so once we have this kind of system, so you can keep trying algorithm. Let's go to, let's say, let's say classifier, J, uh, J48 or, yeah, let's say we, we want to run this once again. To, to narrow, K narrow neighbor once again, so that we can check. This is 87, still, yeah. Now let's see that. Okay, I want to check. This is just K is got to one. Let me check K is got to three. Let's see, it's going to, is it going to have effect on them? You can see it goes to 89. You see from 87 to 89. You keep, you keep going. Maybe K is got to five. What we are doing is called hyperparameter optimization. We are trying to search for the best parameter for an algorithm. So because before you declare finally that an algorithm is not performing, you must check the hyperparameter. You see, it has gone to 90 from 87. Now it's 90. Okay, we keep going. We are just trying. We're just trying with K and then K, the number of K only. So, okay, it's still 90 or so. So you keep checking until the performance goes down. And then you also try to check the order hyperparameter like the like the try to check the hyperparameter like Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, Minkowski distance, and also of others that we say have, and then see if you are able to improve the result further. So this is how you start from getting your data set and then bring it in. So for this case of this data, we have a problem of imbalance. But then what this has demonstrated to us is the fact that you have imbalanced data set doesn't mean that you cannot get algorithm that will still be able to work on it with acceptable result. You see, we've achieved 92% with J48, even without hyperparameter tuning. So with hyperparameter tuning, maybe to get it to even, I've had a case of data set that is seriously imbalanced and we achieve 99% accuracy with both sides correctly classified with very reasonable percentage. Only one mistake from the lower class, only one. We all, almost got, we almost achieved 100% accuracy. Now, so when you have, when you face this kind of situation, you don't need to panic, no, try to run experiment, use different algorithm and see the one that's going to work for you. 
or as the case may be. So then the next thing you are going to do is to move to what we call, after you have tried, got the result for, you didn't do any imbalancing or whatever, hyperparameter optimization is the first step, very important. Once you do hyperparameter optimization for the choice of your algorithms, try others. We have not even tried our friend support vector machine and see how it's going to perform. So try several ones and then see how they are performing on this data set. For example, it would be nice to see support vector machine, SMO. Let's see how it's able to model this particular uh, system. So as case may be, you see support vector machine also started with 85%. You see, you can see here, it's not even able to differentiate. You can see it's not differentiated between the two classes. It's pushing all of them to one side. This is the strong support vector machine. This confirmed our lecture maybe three weeks ago that there's no dogma in machine learning. No algorithm is always better in our situation. KNRS neighbor was able to perform fairly between the two. Even though it's known to be a very simple classifier, you can't compare it with strong support vector machine. But AI support vector machine is not able to quickly, the default value couldn't even produce what KNR, KNN was producing. But of course, this is not the end of SVM. Then you need to do hyperparameter change. Maybe you need to change it from polynomial to Gaussian and host of other optimization of SVM. You can refer to our earlier videos on how to do hyperparameter optimization. So once you have done this, then the next thing you, have, you can then do is to try to do data imbalance resolution. You can do oversampling or undersampling. Over, undersampling is the first step I give to people because we don't want you to use, before you go for kind of manipulative data uh, system, try to do, retain the original data. Try to reduce this to 1850 to 483. See, there are different algorithms to use. You can do it randomly. Randomly select 483 from these 2,000 plus. So that you now have 483 against 483. Then you now run the experiment and then you, you note down your results. That is called undersampling. We, we made the two classes to become of the same sample size. Undersampling. We brought the one that is higher number down to the level of the smaller one. Then the next option is to do oversampling. Oversampling means you want to randomly generate data that we add, keep adding more to this 483 to make it to be 2850. Of course, you can randomly repeat this same data, randomly repeating it until it becomes 2850, or you use SMOT and other methods of inputting imbalance data to solve the problem of imbalance, even though. I am not a big fan of the second option. I like to use the, no, the natural data set, which means since this data is not small, 483 is not a small data set. So reduce this one to 483 so that together you are going to have like 800, 900 and something data. 900 and something samples, it's, it's, to me, is enough for such kind of application. Later, you can then try to check out what you are going to get if you, if you use oversampling. But there are situations whereby your data imbalance is so severe. Let's say you have the first class is 3,000 and the second class is just 50. 50. That is huge. 6,000 to 50. So in that case, you can still do undersampling. Reduce that one to 50 so that you have 100 data samples to train. Then you have to do oversampling to see how it's going to work out. So this is the case and the example for when we pick data from the beginning, from cargo on customer shun, and then to weaker environment where we are able to try to see how the system can perform, even though we notice imbalance in the data set, but still it has demonstrated that not each algorithm respond to imbalance data in a different way. So always use different algorithms don't assume one is always going to work for me. No, the one you thought will work, will work for you might not work on another data set, especially when you have imbalance. So, and that is why we always talk about the principle of let the data speak. So when you have the let the data speak, it means data can speak in different way and the algorithm might understand them in different formats. 
So, and of course, always remember, this is the procedure. We get your data from anywhere, either from Kagu or whatever source. Then from there, you move to selecting the algorithm. Check out the algorithm that's going to work for you. Then check the performance measure. You might need to go back in a looping format. Check what can I do to improve the performance. I got 85%. It's not yet enough. I want more. You need to change the algorithm. This is the first point of call. Change your algorithm. Keep changing them until you get something that is working for you. If at the end of the day, you are not yet satisfied, okay, then you go back all to your data set. Like I said, in case of imbalance, in case of data imbalance, then you need to do, maybe you need to do under sampling. Under sampling, in which case you reduce the majority to become minority sample size. Or you also do over sampling and then see the way things can go. Another thing you can even try also is the feature selection. See, we have not tried that. We mentioned that last time. You see, you have to also do feature selection. Maybe if I reduce the number of features, maybe that will affect my system. In which case, you might have to return back to your weaker environment once again and then try to see, okay, what can I get if I reduce the number of features? You see, account weeks, a contract renewal, before I do that, I know what to, you can do, select feature. Then you choose a type of feature selection you want. I like to use information gain or, or, at, or correlation attributes. Yes. So it, this is called ranker method. So when I, when I run it, it ranked the attribute for me. You can see those with correlation of 0 0.2, these are the ones that are making major effect. Contract renewal, customer service call, day minutes. They plan. So others are a little bit having lower. So those ones with lower correlation, you can go and remove them. See, you can go and remove them under the data set. As the case may be, okay, contract renewal, account weeks, these are not very important. Data plan, monthly charges. Then maybe I remove them. See, then I can now run the experiment and see the good news, you can always bring them back. You see, undo means I don't want you to remove anything. It will return back your data set. But it is being removed on the platform in this particular GUI, but your data is intact in your CSV file. So nothing changes there. So you go to classify now and then run, run it, super vector machine, as the case may be, it's having the same issue. Okay, let's run our K. Uh, our uh, K nearest neighbor, which happens to be one of the most performing. You see? So sometimes your feature selection bring it down. Sometimes it takes it up, depending on the case. But these are some of other areas, I mean, you can explore to, to boost up your, your the performance of your model or to make sure that you improve upon the result you achieved uh, earlier. So I think that is all for now. We're going to have so that we can have time for question and answer section on customer shown prediction, which any customer oriented company or any company definitely they are in need of this kind of application on how, okay, how can we retain our customers because a lost customer is not just lost, but a potential enemy or opponent that might actually call other people to leave or churn the customer. The, the company, or as the case may be. So thank you very much all for listening. So we are going to take a couple of questions before we uh, we call it today. Thank you.